All right, seven now. Write 5.7 times 10 to the power six as the order number. You know I love these questions, guys, because you got a calculator. You could just write in and you get an answer. But, on, but in reality, you don't actually need it. So to rewrite this as an order number, in other words, like a, like a, a natural number which you see, a, a very simple number, 10 to the power six literally means you must have 10 value, uh, six, six um, digits after the five. So think of it as this, you got five and then you got a seven, which is one digit, and then you have five more digits. So zero, zero, and then zero, zero, zero. So these are your six digits. So that's your answer. So just 5,700,000, nothing to it. Now B, write 0 0.04 in standard form. The trick is to write something in standard form, it's just basically like part A. So it's gonna be the first non-zero digit, which is a four. Then you always write times 10 to the power something. Now, because you've got a bunch of zeros before number, you just count how many zeros are there before it. Well, you've got three. And because it's like before the digit, it'll be negative three. And that's it. Now, lastly, work out this one. Again, this is, this is kind of good because you just <laughs> copy that straight in your calculator. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy it now. So make sure you first use the fraction button in your like Casio calculator. So yeah, guys, make sure you have a Casio. And the kind of Casio you should, like I personally recommend, would be any of the GX ones, like, I don't know, was it 83 or 85? Yeah, so just a tr like a standard Casio calculator. So yeah, just pop this into your calculator. So it'd be 2 times 10 to the power 4 plus 3 times 10 to the power 5. Again, all of this is going to be in the top half of the fraction. And on the bottom half, 6.4 times 10 to the power of negative 2. And you just get an answer, well, my calculator, which is 500. Zero, 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 zero. So that's actually reads five million. So you should get an answer of five million. It doesn't say what form to put, guys. So don't bother putting standard form because it doesn't say. But yeah, that's your answer. If you want to put in standard form, well, you got six zeros instead of five. So it'd be five times ten to the power of six. And yeah, I have one of those answers is cool. Now number eight. So yeah, guys. So far the paper hasn't been bad, has it? I feel like this is one of the so far, you know, thank God, I can't, we can't say it's e like very easy, but it's been, like, in my opinion, better than some of the other papers we've seen, because they've been quite challenging, you know, I'm not going to lie, they've been challenging. So thank God, this is not the worst one we've seen. Now, number eight. So, on the 1st of January 2016, Lee bought a boat for $170,000. All right, cool. The value of this boat depreciates by 8% per year. Okay, so what this means so far? You had 170,000 and it's gone down by 8%. So what that means is that you always write a multiplier. So it's always one plus or minus a rate. Well, if it goes down by 8%, it's going to be one minus 8%. 8% is just 0 0.08, okay? So that means it's gone down by zero point. So the multiplier is now 0 0.92. So that's what we need to write. So, so far we have 170,000 times 0 0.92. Okay, work out the value of the boat on the 1st of January 2019. Okay, so notice this, you were at 2016, it depreciates every year by 8% to 2019. So that's three years, so it'd be 0 0.92 to power three. So you always power this by the number of years. And yeah, give your answer credit to nearest dollar. Nice, so just put that in your calculator. And if you do that, guys, you know, you just copy exactly as you do. You should get 132, so 132,000. Three hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars point nine six. Now it says give your answer correct to the nearest dollar. So round it to the nearest whole number, yeah. So if you look at ninety-six, round it up. This one becomes a seven, and that crosses out. So to write it neatly, we got one hundred and thirty-two thousand three hundred and seventy-seven dollars. Okay, not bad. So it's kind of dropped its value, and that's like cars, cars, boats, everything loses value every single year, and yeah. That's something you've got to deal with, unfortunately. All right, nine. So the diagram shows a shape made from a right angle triangle and a semicircle. Okay, so you've got semicircle and a right angle triangle. And okay, so they've got same lengths. So technically, when you've got a triangle with same lengths, this means this is an isosceles triangle, yeah? And for an isosceles triangle, guys, what that also means is that two lengths are the same and both angles are the same. And another thing is, we've got a 90 degrees angle here. So if this is 90, we know a 
whole triangle adds up to 180. So these two must add up to be 90 each. And because they're the same, they have to both be 45 degrees. Okay, because 45 plus 45 is 90, plus 90 is 180 degrees. Okay, cool. So we actually just literally just figured out just from the fact that we've got same lengths and a right angle triangle. Cool. Now, the rest of the information is this. We've got AC is the diameter of a semicircle. Okay, so here's your diameter, meaning halfway across must be the radius. So halfway across the radius. And BA equals BC, we know that. Angle ABC is right angled. Work out the area of the whole shape. All right, cool. So looks like we understand what's going on. Now, what I personally like to do, guys, is that I like to pull out some shapes here. Yeah? I like to make it easy. So let's pull out this triangle for a second. Okay. It doesn't have to be this like nicely drawn by the way, it's not a big deal. So what we have, we got a six, a six, we got forty-five, and we got let's say ninety, yeah? And forty-five as well. Now, my personal tip here yeah, is that we need to firstly work out the area of the semicircle and the area of the triangle separately. Well, to work out the area of a semicircle or a circle, we need to know the radius. We actually don't know the radius, and by the way, guys, the radius is not six. That's just the length, even though it looks like a sector. So to work out this radius, my tip is to firstly work out the whole length. And to work out the whole length, you just pick a triangle rule. I'm going to pick the, the sine rule because I think that's easy to use. Now, let's just call it unknown length x. And according to the sine rule, you just match length of um, angle. So we're going to say, okay, according to the sine rule, we've got x over its opposite, which is 90. So x over sine 90. And then we match to another pair. Let's say 6 over its opposite, which is 45. 6 over sine 45 and to get the result all you do is make x a subject so times sine 90 across so we're gonna have x equals 6 over sine 45 times sine 90 now in your calculator if you do that and you just be careful about it, you sh you should get a result of um, yeah you should get a result of exactly 6 root 2 okay so you get a third now what if you do guys Try avoid changes the decimal, yeah, because we want to kind of keep it like that, because that way you can round your answer properly. So if the that means if the whole thing is six root two, half of six root two, so divide your answer by two, that means the radius is just three root two, okay? It's just half of it. And well, to find the area of a circle now, area of a circle is always pi r squared, and because you got half a circle, it will be all of that divided by two. Now putting this in your calculator, you know the radius is three root two. So the area will be pi times 3 root 2. So wrap the whole thing in a bracket. Squared divided by 2. And if you do that, you should get exactly, well, you can just write 3 root 2 squared over 2. And times your answer by pi, you're going to get uh, exactly 9 pi. So your answer is 9 pi. Or as a decimal, you're going to get 28.27. Again, I prefer the 9 pi form, yeah? So that means your final answer, guys, is going to be what? 9 pi plus. And oh, yeah, also we need to find the area of a triangle, isn't it? So to find the area of a triangle, I should write it down here. The area of a triangle is always half AB sine C. And to, to understand that half AB sine C, just redraw a triangle. You literally need a length AB and an angle between it, C. Well, we know the angle between it is 90. We know A and B are 6. So it's going to be half times. 6 times 6, so 6 times 6, and then sine 90. And putting that in your calculator, <laughs> so it'll be 1 over 2 times 6 squared times sine 90, it's just 18. Convenient, it's just 18. So guys, our total area is therefore 9 pi plus 18, yeah? So the total area is 9 pi plus 18. And that should give us to, what is it, one decimal place here. Yeah? That should give us one decimal place, 46.3. And yeah, guys, you're literally done. That's number nine covered. All right, moving on to number 10. So we've got A equals uh, 2 to the power N times 3 times 5 to the power M. Okay, so looks like we've got a couple of prime numbers here. Now, write 8A as a product of powers of its prime factors. Okay, so... This kind of question is literally telling us that we have a already and now they want to find 8a and rewrite it as powers of products of powers of prime factors. So first things first, let's multiply this whole equation by 8 and see what 8a actually gives us here. Yeah? So we have 8a 
that now gives us the same expression here. Yeah? Uh, the only difference now is that we're now multiplying all of this by essentially 8, yeah? And the only problem here is that 8 itself is not a prime number, so we actually just have to change 8 to a prime number. And to do that, well, if it's not, like, sometimes it's not really obvious to see, I will just use the prime factor tree here, yeah? and I'll just keep breaking it down to prime factors. Well, 8 itself is the same as 2 times uh, 4, and 4 is the same as 2 times 2. And then you always circle the last legs here. Yeah? That's like what we always do. And then we come to realize that 8 is literally the same as 2 to the power 3. Okay? If we really knew this, then we could just do that straight away. So technically, we already have 2 to the power n. And now we have 2 to the power 3. So all together, if we just like add them up, because when you multiply things, you add powers. We essentially have 2 to the power of n plus 3. And we just copy the rest. Times 3 times 5 to the power m. And that's exactly what they're looking for here. Yeah, so 11 now. It says C equals B minus A. A equals 6, correct the nearest integer. So it's being rounded like with some decimal values. And B equals 15, to correct to the nearest 5. Okay, this is an interesting one. Now work out the upper bound for the value of C. I'll show you working clearly. Okay, so what we should do is just firstly bound these up here. So we can say that for A, and we can use like, like inequalities, we have a lower bound and an upper bound. So lower bound values go here, upper bound values go here. Let's do the first one second, yeah? Now, if we're going to round 6 to the nearest integer, me, this means that it would have to be been less than, let's say, 6.5. Usually the trick here, guys, is that we always like typically add a 5. That's kind of what we do. And to round up to 6, it would have to be been 5.5. Okay, so it's always rotating between 5 and 5.5 to 6.5. Now, B is a bit different here because this is something we don't usually see. So it says 15 correct to the nearest 5. So it looks like it's going to be rounding in terms of 5s, yeah? So what that would actually mean is that the highest possible value could have been is that instead of it being, I don't know, like, you, you'd expect it to be 15.5, but that's going to round it to the nearest 1s. So we have to kind of go a bit further. So instead of halving, like, the integer, like halving 1, we need to half this 5 up and down. So half of 5 we can see is... 2.5 and then we're just going to have plus minus to 15 so plusing it to 2 to 15 you're going to get 17.5 and then minusing it to 15 you're going to get 12.5 okay it's kind of the same thing if you look at the first one six instead of instead of them saying round six correct to the nearest integer they could say round six correct to the nearest one which is the same thing and if we half the one you get plus minus 0 0.5 and that's where you add or minus to your six Okay, that's actually probably a simple way to do it, in fact. So we can use this for future questions as well. Now, let's solve the actual question, yeah? So they want us to work out the upper bound for the value of C. All right, an upper bound. Now, when you're subtracting things, yeah, to work out an upper bound, what it wants you to find is literally the greatest distance it can be. Now, to get the greatest distance, you need to get the biggest possible value of B and the value of A, which is furthest away. In other words, the smallest value, yeah? So it's going to be C equals um, the, the upper bound of, uh, what is it, B minus the lower bound of A. So we just put this in a calculator. you got 17.5 minus uh, A would be 5.5. Now, this ain't too bad. So, so 0.5s cancel out. 17 take away 5 is 12. And yeah, I think this is the answer. Yeah, so let's move on. Now, 12. Factorize 2x squared minus 7x plus 6. Okay, um, yeah, let's try this out. So, this is a quadratic equation. Now, to factorize quadratics, you always use a double bracket. Yeah, that's the first thing. Now, one of the rules is, you always look at the coefficient of x squared, the value in front. It says 2x squared. So, we always think two numbers are multiplied to make it. Well, it can only be 2x times x. That's just how it is. And now we look at the last digit, 6. And we then we ask ourselves, what two numbers multiply to make 6? So we just list them up. We've got 1 and uh, 6. And we also have 2 and uh, 3. Okay. Now here comes the main part, yeah? So because we've got a coefficient of 2 here, yeah? So we've got 2x squared. We need to literally multiply one of these digits by 2. And then add or minus them, the result, to get a 7. Or minus 7, yeah? So let's think about it. If it was just like 1 and 6... You know, if we multiplied 1 by 2, we're going to get 2 and 6. Well, 2 and 6, you can never get 7 out of it if you add a minus. If you double, if you times 6 by 2, you get 12. Well, 12 and 1, you can never get. So we're going to just cross this out. We can't use that. 
Now for the second case, if you multiply 2 by 2, you're going to get 4. So 4 and 3, again, actually you can. 4 and 3 you can. So you can say, if you multiply this by 2, in other words, 2x times 2, and this has to be 3, we can actually get a 7x, because minus 2, minus 4x, minus 3x gives us a minus 7x. So in fact, they're both negatives. And yeah, it checks out. That's what we got to do, guys. Now for part B, we got to solve this equation here. And we've got to show clear algebra working. So every time we get an algebra equation, guys, the first thing you want to like literally hit your mind is you got to clear that fraction, yeah? The fraction got to go. And for it to go, you need to literally multiply the whole thing by wherever it is. In this case, 3. So if you multiply 3 across, what actually happens is that the 3 disappears. So you've got 4m plus 9. And because this side doesn't have a 3, you just multiply the whole thing by 3. And you end up with 21 minus, well, 3 times 2m is 6m. Now, this is just a case of just moving things in the right place. So we want to end up getting m equals something, yeah, some value. That's our target. And to do that, we need to move the m terms to the left and the number terms, the one without m's, to the right. So let's do it. Let's move minus 6m across. And if you move things across the equal sign, you flip the sign. So you do the inverse. So minus 6m, move across, becomes a plus 6m. 4m plus 6m is 10m. If you move plus 9 across, becomes a minus 9. 21 take away 9 should give us 12. And that's it. And then to get an m, you just divide 10 across. So m equals 12 divided by 10. Simplifies fraction, you get 6 over 5. Or 1.2. Both is good. And yeah, 4, four marks for that. Ah, wow. Okay, cool. That's actually a lot. Now see, write um, the fourth root of y over y in the form of y to the power b. Okay, this looks intimidating, but it's actually not. So this thing here, you just have to write in index form. Well, the fourth root of y literally means, well, instead of y to the power 4, it will be y to the fourth, 1 over 4. And then we have to divide that by y. And remember, y on its own is just y to the power 1, because it's just a single power. Now, if you remember the rules, if you divide two terms of the same base, you subtract its powers. So 1 over 4, so core, take away 1. If you're not sure what that is in, in, um, mentally, just use a calculator. You should, get, you should get minus 3 over 4. And that's your index form. And that's it, guys. That's this question done.